Hi, this is Steve Cunningham, and uh, you're listening to Catholic vs. Catholic. Tell us a little bit about yourself, if you would, who you are, what you believe, and how you came to believe what you believe. No problem. Uh, I'm Steve Cunningham. I run uh, censusfidelium.us and the correspondent YouTube channel. And uh, I was cradle Catholic, baptized in the faith. Mom was the only Protestant Catholic in the family. Dad was Presbyterian, but mostly probably agnostic. Not Protestant, really didn't really care. Actually, he converted right before he died. Uh, my brother and I were so out of it that we didn't even care. Went to college, played baseball and basketball in college. High school as well. Sport family is a big sports family. Grew up playing golf. Grew up playing everything except soccer. Uh, went to school. Became uh, basically, uh, uh, I guess you could say, a born again communist, <laughs> as everyone from high college basically does anymore. I had to had to deprogram myself when I got out. Uh, still wasn't big enough. Would, would go check off my. Uh, you know, my timesheet, go to church, go to a confession once a year almost or whatever it was once a month and uh, usually repeat the same thing over and over again. Went to, you know, just what typical guys do, I guess, anymore. They just check off the box. All changed when I was uh, took a job with uh, medical sales and uh, started listening to talk radio, and that changed my political perspective on a lot of things, and especially getting in the workforce like that. and. I changed my tune on Facebook, which my brother and I would always, people would say they inter, they enjoyed our conversations because they looked like they were we were trying to make each other laugh. And I started changing my tune, and then he started going, well, if he's going to do state stuff, I'm going to do religion stuff. So for all for Len, he started doing the uh, saint of the day for about, uh, yeah, for all, all 40 days. By the end of it, he was thinking about becoming a priest. <laughs> He texted me up. I would listen. I would look at what he was saying, but I really didn't, you know, care much. I would read it and listen to what he posted, but people would text me up asking what was his problem. And, uh, yeah, I remember one guy, a buddy of mine, big South Carolina, University of South Carolina fan. Man, he's so arrogant. I go, wait, wait a minute. You're a Gamecock fan, right? Yeah. They're in the SEC, right? Yeah. You think they're the best conference in the, in the world in football, right? Yeah. Is that arrogance or truth? So that was my first apologetic defense. <laughs> Still really didn't care much. Uh, he doesn't talk to me anymore, really. That that one guy used to be a real good friend of mine. Anyway, my brother sent me a text once on St. Jerome, ignorance of scriptures, ignorance of Christ. And I just said, all right, the heck with it. I'll read. And so read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, first time ever. And was blown away by... Uh, uh, I remember st that sticking out Mary Magdalene having seven demons. For some reason that stuck out on me. I was like, all right, finish that. What's next? And got turned on to Bishop Sheen for EWTN shows. Uh, that brought me to Catholic Answers, brought me to sermons online. And then I really fell hard to me. I went, started going to Daily Mass. It was right down the street from us. I remember hearing a uh, lecture Q&A online. It's still up there. There was a question on how to dress in Mass. Before this, I was dressing in maybe a golf shirt and shorts and maybe maybe a tennis shoes or vest. That was my Sunday best. And I heard that and I, the next day I was in a three piece. And uh, I remember <laughs> my senior Harris goes, "Steve, hey, what are you doing? You look like you're going to a funeral." I go, "Well, we are at a marriage reception." I, I'm told. <laughs> Never went back. Always been wearing a suit and tie ever since that. Just hearing that it really put up you know foot up my butt and uh, to get me going. Though all my coaches were always like that, I'm type that someone needs to really challenge me, they need to whack me up top of the head. And you know, most of the times, people worried about uh, offending somebody. And I like, you know, I, I wanted to be, I wanted to play for Bob Knight. All my coaches were military guys, you know, calling me names. Dad was like that, so that's kind of I gravitate towards. Uh, started the uh, census Fidelium uh, on a uh, idea with uh, Greater Glory, the movie. I remember. Uh, I'm a knight. Don't tell anybody. It might hurt my reputation. They were supposed to do the promotion for the greater glory. And uh, I remember my, my brother and I and a friend of ours went to go see it, and there was five people there. And both the other two looked like they were, you know, 150 years old. And it was out for maybe two days. Nobody went to go see it. And so I was thinking, well, if I got it, there's a sermon online. Let me see if I could put that together and maybe help promote it. And that made what well, was the first sermon. I put that on the videos. And, that led to, all right, whatever, if I hear something that I 
find out that I've never heard of before. Maybe someone else has it, and I'll put another one up. So well, we had like 3,000 videos since, <laughs> about one per day for the last six years, and still learning. Now uh, we're about to hit 100,000 subscribers. I never thought that would be a thing six, seven years ago uh, when I started doing this. Well, yeah, that's why I said in the email that I pictured you like with a security team and a pulp mobile. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, most people have no, I remember uh, somebody online, because I, mean, I, I had no idea this was going to be like this way. The YouTube URL actually says One Arm Steve still on the top. I don't know how to change that. That was my, that was a nickname from College of Charleston days. It was a widespread panic song named One Arm Steve. And uh, my friends just started calling me that, so it just stuck. Anyways... I remember a friend texts me up because, oh, you're you're Steve from you're the guy that does the video. I go, oh man, I gotta change my name somehow. I gotta get my name off this. So that was where I was trying to find a name for the channel. Went from one to another, and finally led to Sensei Videlium. And I think I did. Was it an interview? Was, I can't remember. My face got on what I can't remember if I was asking for help or we were doing a one of the fairs, the festivals, and my face got on there. Nobody had a clue who the, who I was. And then I was at the parish one time, and they go, you're that guy. Guys from back home, they had no idea who I was. We'd sit there in this room, and they knew me for years. And they were uh, my brother. Uh, my brother, he was the uh, fourth year, third or fourth year seminary. And, you know, brothers, I would get, we jabbed each other. So uh, we're in the, uh, it was Christmas time, and he goes, oh, brother, you look over here. It's At the time, Video Soccer. He goes, that's Video Soccer over there. <laughs> the guy next to me looks at me and goes, you're that guy? I, I'm a huge fan. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to find Orthodox Catholic content. There's a lot of stuff that's um, wolves in sheep's clothing trying to co-opt the Catholic Church on the left and on the right. It's easier. I find it easier to identify wolves on the left than the wolves on the right. But um, the enemies of the church that are on the right, uh, can you just talk a little bit about their tactics, please? And I remember the first time coming against the city of a contest, and I remember my brother was talking about it, he goes, they're very smart, they're very slick. And uh, to somebody that's looking for something, and I remember looking at my first city website, I, I was kind of new at the time. I stumbled on this going, you know, these they're making some solid arguments. I mean, now let me dig in deep on this, maybe question things. And I remember you know, asking him, so what do you think? Just stay away from that junk, you know, blah, 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 and, you know. The more I looked at it going, that's eh, just built on emotion. So you're going after your emotion. They, you know that it's trouble out there, the problem out there, and they just they know the buttons that they hit. I get a lot of studies, obviously, from the YouTube channel and Twitter. They come out of the woodworks. Uh, they twist Bellman. They act like they're, they're, you know, to a regular person, they sound very smart. They're quoting papal encyclicals, letters, councils, Bellarmine. And uh, that was one thing about my bud Ryan Grant that uh, he's translating you know, all of Bellman's works, because the priest went up to him and goes, uh, hey, the Sedes know this stuff, and they're quoting from this, and most of our people don't know Latin, which is sad. And uh, he goes, can you translate? Can you start doing this? So that was when, after he got done with the uh, day controversies on the Roman Pontus, is, uh, that was a big help for what I hear for uh, Cisco and uh, Salsa, John Salsa. And uh, so they, they that book's been very good on checking their arguments and retaliating with what the church teaches, what Bellman teaches, what Be what they're screwing, what they're twisting, what Bellman is saying. They're you know, modern-day Protestants, basically. They reject the papacy. You know, they, they reject this, but they say they, they're for this, but reject Vatican I. Or, or they're for this, but they reject the visible authority of the church, saying the church is now the Vatican II church, unquote, unquote, which is another church than the other church, which but that doesn't make any sense. Where is this other church? We have to have a visible head. Visible society, all connected to the author, uh, the magisterium. But you know, it's kind of like uh, Mormons and other those guys that they get you in with one thing, and then by they don't give you the other stuff until you get into their programs. Really, not that I tried Mormonism or anything. That's what I read. But yeah, it's and, and you know, I'm not a, everyone. Most guys on there know I'm not a society guy. I haven't met a society person that showed joy. They're always bitter or upset or, uh, or back home in Charlotte. <laughs> the, the friends back home that tell me that there's a lady that runs or a family that runs that parish and they've executed people from there or people won't talk to you because you don't go to the society thing and, uh, and that's all of it I do text with a society priest good friends he found me on LinkedIn 
uh, chat with him a lot. He's a good, he's a solid guy. Uh, he's gotten in trouble with his own priest for praying when he passes the cemetery. You know, just doing a regular prayer. Uh, his fellow priest bashed him about it. I'm still waiting for a traditional media guy you know, besides church militant to call out that priest that is on uh, the society's YouTube channel for saying, telling people not to go to a Noah's Order Mass because he says it's evil. Uh, full disclosure, I'll go down the street. If there's a you know daily Mass, I do Uber right now. And if I'm wanting to go to a Mass, if it's a Noah's Order one right down the street, I check the church mat, the Mass Times app, and I'll dip right in. Uh, I'll, I'll treat it as a low mass. I'll kneel most of the time. I keep my head down. I don't shake hands. I'm trying to, you know, be as reverent as I can. Kneel, kneel, walk down the middle so I don't step on a Lord from communion in the hand. Uh, do everything I can. And people usually ask questions, and that's a great way to educate those people who aren't listening to, say, like a Dr. Marshall channel, or they don't follow the liturgy guy. A buddy of mine runs that. See, a lot of us do good work within our circles. But those same people, that those, those the people that we really need to get to, aren't looking at those websites or the links or videos or anything like that. I mean, how many times you see people on Facebook post, "Don't put your arms in orange for possession," but then you go to a, a parish and you see that's all the people do. But none of those people are reading that that blog. Um, so it's, it's I'm not I'm not one of those guys that say, "Hey, be really a cloister, a cloister family." Stay in your parish. Don't go out and try to bring anybody in. I'm going. I remember a friend of mine gave us the best compliment. We uh, met him. He moved from here to Tryon, North Carolina, and uh, we invited him out for beer and pizza after mass. He goes, "You guys, you're y'all some weird trads. <laughs> you're laughing. You like beer. You drink. You have a good time. Yeah, yeah. Life sucks. Grab a helmet. Let's have some fun during it too. I mean, so some joy. You don't you don't attract anybody complaining about Vatican II 24 seven. It's actually one of those things that someone comes up to me and says, what do you think about Vatican II? I'm done. I walk right away. I don't want to talk about it. Talk about something else. You probably didn't read about it. You probably didn't read it. You're probably just parroting somebody that posted something about it. And I don't care. What's, what, what's, the, good, what, what's the point? Like uh, guys that gripe about the Pope uh, all the time. Yeah, we have bad Pope. I remember a priest that had a great one. He goes, it's like uh, your dad being an alcoholic. You still love him. Pray for him to get, you know, maybe pray for a good death. Uh, but what the heck is tweeting about it 24-7 going to do? So even guys on our side that aren't in the, quote, far, far, far right extremes, they need, I mean, it's, it, the motion sells. It's easy to get into. It's easier to complain than it is to pray, do penances, sacrifice a novena or anything like that. Um, even when I'm here, when I go out to the, the people's fair, I can't get anybody to come join me. The uh, trads in general get to the idea that it's just about going to mass on Sunday, and that's really about it. Now that's a, that's a generalization, but I I can't find it. There's it's hard to get people to come out and do you know hey let's recruit let's go out and get some people to come in let's let's go fish them in and then bring them to the priest and let the priest do their job. That's our job to bring them in. Their job is to educate them. But no, we want to fix Rome, kind of like everyone wants to fix BC. Uh, it's, it's Let's fix our families, fix the house, fix the city, and then we'll go. We'll worry about big time later. But yeah, but uh, just talk a little bit about Pope Francis. Can you just talk a little bit about the man? Yeah, I mean, uh, from what I understand is, uh, I mean, we got to know what you got to look in the background where he came from from that that situation in in uh, Argentina too. But I, a friend of mine was telling me that he came out when he was a, was a bishop or priest. He spent some time in some prison down there. Or I can't remember what exactly the whole situation was, but when he got out of it, it everyone said it changed him. I mean, he's been, you'll, you'll see great quotes that he said uh, about uh, homosexuality, going against that, going after abortion. I get tired of the 24-7 news coverage that everyone has to treat every word that he says as infallible, which is incorrect. Uh, just because he sneezes doesn't mean it's an infallible sneeze. If he's on an airplane, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, I get texts all the time. What did you think about what he said? Was it about faith and morals? Was it from the chair? No. Uh, fine. I'm, I got something else to do. He is the Pope, good or bad. We've had good popes. We've had bad popes. You can become a saint under a bad pope. You can go to hell under a good pope. Frank uh, Sheet had a great line or something about we don't, uh, we're not going to see the beatific vision of the pope. Or we're not going to be in the uh, communion of cardinals in heaven. It's a sermon I got up called Christ is the Point. And it talks about the Pope Formosus 
uh, trial with Pope Stephen before him, or Pope Stephen uh, digging up Formosas and putting him on trial. It's just a, a modern day thing that we just get away from. He's our dad. He's our whole, like we said before, he's, he's your father. You can have a good father. You can have an alcoholic father. You still love your father. It's been a good thing. For me, I consider it a good thing in a sense. Every time someone brings it up, he's, it's been easier to start conversations in society about this. Uh, when we had the table up uh, at the uh, carnivals, everybody came up wanted to ask our opinion about the Holy Father. And it's an easy topic to get in. Now, you're all, already talking about the papacy. You're already talking about infallibility. You're talking about the church and what you know, the past, history, all this. They bring up councils. We bring up Vatican, they bring up Vatican II. We say, yeah, it's a legitimate council. You don't turn into a super council. The left does it. The right does it. One acts like it's the greatest council in the history of the world that it started the church. The other side acts like it's the worst council in the history of councils, and it ended the church. If you look at it, I mean, there's, a, there's actually a talk by now, Senator the contest of Jerry Maddox, where he talks about reading all the, all the council documents in light of tradition, you'll have no problem. That's his words. Now, unless he goes back and says, no, that Jerry was an idiot. I doubt, I don't know what he would say now. But uh, I have it on audio. Uh, and that's how you, you read it in light of tradition. You won't fall off the boat on that. It's not a super council. Uh, the Holy Father is not a dictator. He might say something, but it's, unless it's under faith and moral, it's read by Bellarmine and the controversies in Roman Pontiff. There's actually a chapter that talks about, you, know, you see all these guys yelling at him. Nobody on planet Earth can judge a pope. That was a chapter of one of Bellman's books, uh, Bellman's, uh, in Bellman's book, because uh, they can't do anything to a future pope. You see all these guys talking about he's a heretic. Well, he hasn't said anything under, and under faith and morals uh, from the chair. That's heresy. We've had popes to speak that from the pulpit before. They weren't called heretics. We've had, you know, fair things, knowing that they were wrong, but they still had, kind, they still said, spoke about him in a charitable way, pietal way, instead of you got these guys throwing out, calling him Gregorio all the time. And you know, that's what they say that he wants to be called, but that doesn't matter. You still treat him as the Pope. You ain't him. And it's, it's, it's a turnoff when you see the guys go after him as much as it is, but it also goes with 24-7, 365, social media. Everyone wants to put news up. Uh, no one wants to see, talk about someone's good side. Hey, is the Holy Father bad? I'm not going to say he's 100% evil. He's, 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 people call him the Antichrist. I mean, holy God, I mean, come on. <laughs> let's, let's, let's tune that down a little bit. Everything he's, I mean, it, you look at saintly popes. Not everything they did was perfect. They, they probably said something guys today would hate. But we didn't have the media on him 24 7, 365 with a microphone, and they weren't on airplanes, and they weren't posting their stuff on Twitter, and they weren't doing uh, YouTube uh, Angelus you know, speeches and all this. So, yeah, all of a sudden now we act like he's the worst thing in the history of the planet. If you're not praying for him, you complain about him more, then you have the problem, actually, my, my idea of it. So, as the person, uh, I remember people getting on him about the, the Globetrotters being in, in, being in the Vatican. I immediately posted a photo of Pius the Twelfth having the Globetrotters at the Vatican. <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on! <laughs> um, they might have dressed a little bit better back in, in Pius the Twelfth day, but it's, and yeah, it is it is questionable when you see him bring guys like uh, Katy Perry up to speak to people. And you're going, why why this? But hey, what what can we do? I'm in Denver, Colorado. I can't control the Vatican. Like, Wherever those guys are, you're in, you know, they're in, you know, wherever, wherever, USA. Just, if they worry more about themselves, become saints, than worry about what the Holy Father does every moment of the day, they probably be a let off. Yeah. And it's funny because Pope Francis actually had that big poster put on his door, no complaining, right? That was one of the first things he did in his pontificate. <laughs> I didn't know that. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the first things he did. A uh, big poster says no complaining. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what does complaining do? Absolutely nothing. What do you think of Pope John the Twenty Third and Paul the Sixth? What do you think about them? Do you like them? The popes, I mean, I'm, I'm not a huge uh, scholar on both of them. I only know I clip notes of what I've heard from others. Uh, that Paul the Sixth, Pope St. Paul the Sixth was a uh, yes man type deal. And he apparently his heart was in the right way of he wanted to convert the uh, Protestants, but... His means of doing it was very poor, and, and it, you know, obviously backfired pretty badly. I don't think he was out to destroy the church. Uh, 
John the Twenty Third, Pope Saint John Twenty Third, same. Uh, where he was a very jolly, happy kind of soul. And he wrote the uh, a great encyclical that zero, that basically no priests read anymore. Uh, the term sapientiae, basically, te- it's basically telling that you must know Latin before you uh, uh, graduate a seminary before you go a priest. <laughs> Yeah, for people that you you go around the guys that are yeah back and do back and do and you you hear uh oh what's the what about better terms at the essay from John uh, John the twenty third and like what uh they don't read that one but uh yeah I mean I, he may be a day of uh, Paul Paul the six which I wish he would have done said it was infallible but he didn't but uh still was a great encyclical that uh I mean we can't toss that out but. <clears throat> You saw the outlash from the Canadians after that immediately. The church, I mean, people rejected him for saying that, rejected the, the contraception for it. I mean, he got a lot of backlash. He talked about the smoke of saying that was his words. It sounds like from what I heard from other people and uh, from the little I've read about him is he really wanted to convert the Protestants, but he just did it in a terrible way. But, I mean, you look back at the change of everything. We have Pope St. Pius X changed the uh, divine office that nobody thought was ever going to change. And that was the beginning of, the, hey, maybe we can, maybe the liturgical, the liturgical guys were going, maybe we can change this. And then you got during Paul the XII's reign when they changed uh, uh, the, the Holy Trium, which, thanks be to God, it's uh, a, lot of, a lot more traditional parishes are getting, are being okay to do that again, which is really cool if you haven't been to one. And then after that, you had, you know, the overhaul of Paul the VI Mass. It was just, gradual come through that there it wasn't like that somebody woke up and said hey let's do this and the next day they did that it was you know this was in the plans for years and years and years decades prior for it but uh got Paul the sixth stamp you know name stamped on it so he gets the uh they'll get the brunt of that for all of human history and like I said I'm, you know, I don't want to condemn them to the fourth realm of hell obviously you can't because they're Canaanite like saints uh but Look at, and again, that goes back to a lot of trans complaining about that, looking back and always, always ad nauseum, bringing that stuff up, going, okay, probably right on this. What can we do to go forward? What can we do to bring the change, to make it back? And going up to somebody that uh, has zero idea of what's going on like this and then just going up, oh, yeah, well, Paul VI sucks, and John XXIII is terrible, and canonizations aren't infallible when Ryan just pu- republished the – he just got that translated, the canonizations according to Bellman, which says across the board they're infallible. <laughs> Still in with faith and morals. I think Vatican I says that too. And uh, he's got a lot of people mad about that, but it goes back to emotion. How many people get emo- just tear up on emotion on this and don't let the, the logic and reason come through? But yeah, I mean, they spent, hopefully well, see, we'll see them up in heaven. I mean, you know, I don't think anybody's going to try to kick them in the butt or anything over it, but. Yeah, it sucks what happened. It's happened. Let's go. Let's move on. We can't. We can't get into the DeLorean and go back in time and say, "Hey, by hey, Paul the Sixth, we got. You might not want to do this. <laughs> Here's why. Yeah, let's go back and do that to Luther, and then let's go back to do that with Muhammad. And take them. You know, get them before they turn do something weird. Yeah, some of the. I guess what you call traditional Catholics claim that the Muslims don't worship the same God as us. Is that your understanding as well, or no? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not the same God. I know the Catechism of the Catholic Church says something kind of vaguely about that, and I was, uh, I think, uh, one of the popes that we've worshipped, I think maybe John Paul II, I, I'm not 100% sure. But, no, it's not the same God, per se, because obviously it's not Trinitarian. And uh, they don't look at our Father as a Father. They look at uh, they look at God as uh, a basically a dictator-type deal thing. So it's... You know, they might say God, but it's it's kind of like a a Mormon saying, you know, Jesus Christ. It's a different idea of who that is. Well, I would I would personally I would classify the Jews and the Muslims as true monotheists. Not to say that there aren't branches of Judaism and Islam that stray from true monotheism, but there's that there's that idea of classical theism where uh, there's an all-powerful God that created everything out of nothing, and he's infinite in every perfection. Uh, You know, that is monotheism. And uh, although there are Jews and Muslims and even Christians who stray from that, the main lines of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, traditionally at least, 
are all monotheistic. They all subscribe to that classical theism. So for me, that puts them all into a higher class than Mormonism, which is a sort of naturalism, where it's just the biggest and best material entity is what they call God. Right, right. And then you got Islam that has the same materialistic heaven. Uh, you know, just like the Mormons, you got that idea of becoming gods. But yeah, yeah, you're right on the monotheistic part, but it's just a different idea, per se, of what God is versus what we would say he is. Yeah, but I mean, each and every one of us, when we get to heaven, will be discovering endlessly for all eternity who and what God is, the mystery of God entering into that mystery. So it's not like you right now understand who and what God is sufficiently. I mean, obviously, as a Catholic, you have access to all of the saving truths of religion. You have access to them. And that's why it's a dogma of the church, that the church is a perfect society. You have access to all of those saving truths, whereas the Muslim doesn't and the, the Protestant doesn't. But in heaven, you're going to be discovering more and more and more of the truth of who and what God is, and it's inexhaustible. So really, we're all in the same boat in terms of our ignorance, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll never know that, you know, the, you know in heaven we'll be up there, be at the vision, is contemplating God forever. And, you know, we can't wrap our people minds like the Augustine dream of, you know, putting the, you know, trying to trying to figure out the Trinity. you got the little Christ child that came in and said that, uh, what are you trying to do? It's like, we're trying to put the, uh, I'm trying to figure out the tree. So, well, why don't you, why don't you put the, you know, he's asking the little Christ child about putting the water into that little hole. So I'm trying to put the ocean in this hole. And that's like your mind about the Holy Trinity. So yeah, I mean, we'll never be able to figure that concept out. But as in the sense of what he is versus what Muslims talk about in a blank sense and the basic points, it's not the same kind as in, like I said, father versus dictator type deal. They would they would object to him be call, they would object to us or them calling God father. Uh, they don't look at that as he is father figure, you know, loving in the sense. They look at it as more of a like a tyrant in the sense. And our, our idea of God's will and our idea is different from their idea in God's will, as in saying like uh, he moves a pen. You know, across the board, that's God making my hand move the pen versus, you know, God's positive will, you know, in our lives. Or we'll say, you know, God, he wants, he wants it sunny out or right now it's kind of cloudy. Then he wants a cloudy out when it's cloudy because that's what he's deemed it for right now. And then, you, you know, it's, it's yes, it's monothe- monolithic, but it's, yeah, if I walk up to a Muslim now, which, I love having them where we're at those, par- at those parks or festivals. They're, uh, they're usually next to us, so it's always a great time. But, uh, yeah, they would not they would not call. They would definitely disagree with saying that uh, he's a father. Yeah. Um, what do you think of uh, Medjugorje? Because I think it's clearly demonic. What do you think? Uh, <laughs> I think you think you got that one. Yeah, I get a bunch of Medj heads all the time. Uh, I jokingly call it the demon of Medju. <laughs> Funny thing about that is I got in a car wreck about two years ago, and uh, I always say, you know, some, I always say how Mary before I, you know, before I drive, and I had a miraculous metal on the door, and uh, then on the uh, car hit me right where the metal was. Anyway, I go to the place a week later, and the guy hands me a baggie. He goes, "Oh, here's all the stuff we found underneath the underneath the, in the car. You know, like there was some metals and things we found. You know, metals. And I just had the one right there. Somebody dumped like five measured metals." underneath my car and I clean it all the time. I, you know, do it over and you try to vacuum, try to make your car look nice. So I don't know how those things got there, which would happen the day that I get I get hit and I jokingly said the demon of Medjew was trying to take me out. <laughs> so I'm hoping they condemn that thing. Uh, uh, there's plenty of evidence against it. Yeah, that's great that people convert th- through it. Awesome. Uh, they're so, they're, you know, you don't want to be so attached to that thing that when they condemn it that you say, they the church was wrong, we're right. That's the danger in that whole thing. Yeah. What are you, um, sort of day to day, what are you excited about now with your faith and with growing in the faith and with spreading the faith? Can you just talk about what you're excited about with Catholicism today? No, yeah, it's just, you know, yeah, projects, just continue doing what we're doing, just trying to, you know, get more out there. And the wife's got ideas about merchandise ideas, just, uh, you know, like puzzles and shirts and things like that and cups, mugs with, you know, great images on it just to, 
you know, images raise our minds to our Lord and meditate that way. So just images like that just help bring people up and want to find out, hey, what's about this image or what, what's about this saint and try to grow devotion a little bit more. So it's it's cool to see when you see somebody get turned on and how they react to it and what they want to, you know, just to be a part of that is really overwhelming. Talking about people who said they just stumbled upon this site, they never heard of this, and how on fire they are to learn more. And that's the thing that said when he wrote uh, True Devotion. And it's fantastic. I, mean, I wish more people would read that one. It was from the you know, 1400s, I think, or early 1500s. And it talks about the turned him on to turn, the writing True Devotion Virgin, which uh, I'm trying to think of the priest's name, but it was written before Louis, and he picked up on it, and that's what turned him on to write about the holy slavery. Uh, it's a fantastic, edifying book on that, and you know, right now I'm in a chapter about St. Joseph, and it talks about how, just to, you know, we, I, mean, I knew about how great St. Joseph is, and heard sermons, and heard this, and all that, but you read it from somebody back in those days, and it really digs in deeper, it really turns you on even more. But right, right now, just, we're doing a program, folks, don't have a lot of, you know, links or resources to use. So I found a uh, Bible commentary online at a, a friend of mine who's we're trying to transcribe that on the website. Bible commentary on in Spanish. Got them doing English too, but it's especially in Spanish. And they got uh, sermons in Spanish, com- uh, catechism classes from the fraternity in, in-, in Mexico, Garen J's liturgical year in Spanish. Uh, just trying to get a lot more stuff out there because what I hear is that they don't have a lot, especially traditional sources. So that's a project pretty excited about. And uh, got a, I, I had a guy in the car the other day. He was a Mexican to uh, Texas. It was going to be a 38 hour ride. He didn't really say much in the car, so I gave my my business card at the end and said, "Hey man, if you want, and I got to check this out when you're on the drive. It's got plenty of hours." Of, uh, Plenty of hours of videos on there, and you can, uh, especially in Spanish, and he he starts smiling from ear to ear, going, "Dude, that's this is what's up." So I, every time I I see somebody that's uh, Latino, and I tell them about this, they really get jacked about it. And from like I said, from what I hear, they uh, from multiple priests that do Spanish missions, uh, they don't have a lot of stuff. So we're trying to do a little bit more with that and get some more out there. And then obviously on top of that, doing the Bible commentary and. Uh, trying to work on other projects as well, apologetics, things like that. But trying to be a one-stop shop. Exciting. I always, at the end of my interviews, I ask my guests to give the closing thought, just something positive for the listener. So what do you think that you might be able to say to anyone that's out there listening now? Hey, there's a lot out there. If you want to be a truth seeker, keep reading. For Catholics, be a saint. Read. Complain. Don't complain as much. Keep, do what he just said. Be joyful. Say rosary. Promote the rosary. Uh, and set ace. Suck it up. Get back in the ship. I'm, I'm one of those guys with tough love. Uh, we just got to be a saint. What else is there? If you like your worldview, if you think it's swell, if you've got some questions, ask me and I'll tell. All you've got to do is ask. All you've got to do is ask.